When it comes to modern poker icons, you don't get more rock and roll than Tom Dwan. When we first started releasing our I Am High Stakes Poker videos, the feedback was unanimous. We want Tom. We want Tom. Well, here he is. Tom, how's life? Um, too much poker, not enough sleep this last week, but that's normal. We're at the end of uh, the Triton series, so that's how it normally goes. And we're in Montenegro. Where does Montenegro stand uh, in terms of places that you like to play and, and hang out in? I think it's probably either my favorite or second favorite here in London. I mean, Vegas is great too. Um, but I was just explaining to you that it, it uh, I really like the aspect of getting to play and then being able to walk outside and see this scenery and have you know, a day on the beach or whatever. Um, this last week I haven't done any of that. I've just been playing Tritons all day, so. <laughs> um, but sometimes if there's games here over the summer and stuff, there'll be more of that where it's play for three days and then have a beach day or something, and that's nice. Yeah, this one has been a particularly... Oh, this one has been... <laughs> a brutal, oh. in a, brutal in a good way, but very uh, exhausting on everybody concerned, I think. Yeah, and uh, there were different cash games. There were d different groups of cash games. There was, uh, it was a lot of, for me, a lot of work, not enough sleep. <laughs> And I didn't even win, so. No, that makes it even worse. Yeah, yeah. Um, going right back to, going back, back to the beginning in a chronological order of things, when you, was in, when you was in school, how did Tom Dwan fit into that kind of like rigid structure, rules oriented uh, um, educational system? I think for me, I've always, you know, I think I told you this before, but... Uh, I can follow and respect and stuff some, some rules, but my thing is I always got to say why. And if there's not a good answer for the why, I just, you know, I, I don't like it. <laughs> and, uh, so I think in, in school I sometimes ran into some issues there. You know, I, uh, the classes I'd like or the thing, things I enjoyed, I would um, sometimes learn a bit, sometimes do well in the classes, but I remember like math, they said, here's the way you need to do this problem. And I said, why? And they were like, you might not always have a calculator on you. It's like, but yeah, I think, I think we will. I don't know how the yeah. world's going to play out, but I think we will. I'm like, why? Well, come on, I'm, doing, I'm getting the right answer. And, yeah, um, you're, not, you're not that old, Tom. I mean, yeah, you know, I'm sure we, the, we had the internet and mobile phones and stuff, innit? So you, you're quite right there. Those are ridiculous things to say, aren't they? Well, but I think that I've, I've always been a why person I don't you know I'll follow some stuff for a while but but if it's longer term for me I'm like well why do I need to do this this way like the math thing in school was uh you know showing my work a certain way or something I was like I got the right answer this should count you know and I think I had a bit of that uh in my life which is probably a you know large part of why I stumbled on found poker and it worked good for me of more like make a lot more of my own choices um, as opposed to following some structure that maybe you know some parts of it I'd have have trouble with it's I mean it's it seems like a really positive quality to have I mean I got two kids and they always go through this I mean the 18 year old went through this phase and I'm sure my two-year-old will of why 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 and at some point society seems to kick that out of a lot of kids doesn't it it's like stop asking these questions <laughs> Yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's a that's a pretty fair take, and uh, yeah, for me, I, I you know I can deal with some rules for a while, but long term, I like to have something make sense to me. If I'm mm. you know uh, I'm gonna go that way, and I guess with poker, the you're answering your own. You know, why, why am I going to this game or that game or learning this new game or... Um, I've always liked something about the freedom that comes with it, trying to make, make my own choices, find my own path, that kind of stuff. Um, so. I always remember reading a great book by Robert Fritz called The Path of Least Resistance and when I hear you talk it, it reminds me of the vast majority of society head down in the herd doing what we're supposed to do and a few outliers going, Hang on a minute, I think I'll go that way. Um, 
you certainly went that way, but where did that, can you remember any early realizations that you were going to be different? Um, I guess even when you say that, I don't, I don't view it really as that I'm different, but I mean, I obviously do have such a unique kind of life path. So, um, I guess just to me, I always would kind of look at things and say, why do I need to do them a certain way? And sometimes there'd be a good answer and then you need to do them a certain way. Um, but yeah, for some reason, poker just fit for me where it was, yeah. So it, it, wasn't, it wasn't like, um, like when I grew up, I remember thinking, I, I don't want a job. I don't want a boss. Like it was really important to me that I didn't have it. Was it like that for you or did you just fall in love with this game so much that you, you couldn't see anything else other than that? No, so for me it's, I don't mind uh, li like taking direction to a point or something like that if it seems reasonable. So I think what I would have said then would have been something like I don't want a boss that's not unreasonable reasonable yeah. or that's not yeah, smart. Yeah. But the, my, sometimes my tolerance for that stuff can be surprisingly low, you know. And yet other times I can be in a game where some businessman wants me to play for 40 hours and just deal with it because I'm like, oh, it's a good game, that's okay. Yeah. So I don't know, I don't know exactly how my mind works on that stuff, but. Can you remember when the time came, the crunch time came where you're, I don't know, 18, 19, 20 and you're, you're studying and you're thinking, well, am I gonna carry on with my studies or am I gonna give this poker finger shot or am I gonna get a job? What was happening around that time period? So I put a, uh, Halfway through my senior year of high school, I put $50 online. And uh, by the end of the summer, I think I had, or sorry, by the start of the summer, I think I had made 10 or 15,000 or something like that. And um, I wanted, I remember I wanted to get a shore house, a Jersey shore house with uh, some of my high school buddies for like a week. It was a week or two weeks or something. And uh, I remember my mom saying, like, you know, you got to go get a job and then you can use that money. And obviously I put my 50 bucks online. I made like 15,000 and I was like, oh, I got yeah, your sure house. Yeah. <laughs> and um, then I think I made a little money. That's, you know, maybe it was 30 by the end of the summer or something. And then I went to school, to, to college. I went to Boston University. And uh, the, my freshman year, there were so many things I really liked about it socially. There were um, interesting things of, you know, I grew up in New Jersey, now I'm in Boston. Uh, you know, I think the city of Boston, especially as like a young college student, has such a unique culture. Um, and and uh, there was a lot of stuff I liked about that experience. And then I also liked some of my classes, but the ones I didn't like, I just didn't you know, keep my grades up in and stuff, didn't yeah. show up for the classes sometimes, didn't show up for the tests sometimes. And at the end of my freshman year, I had to go to some summer school thing because I like hadn't shown up for some English class stuff and whatever. And uh, I don't remember exactly, but I think I probably made 80,000 or something by, by that point, which was a decent sum, but also not like drop out of college, go on a completely different life path. Yeah. Uh, kind of money and so I was doing the whole show up to my classes in the summer and stuff but I was playing more and more poker and I was I remember there was a time I played mainly two dollar four dollar so a four hundred dollar buy-in and I just really sat down and was like okay I need to just win some silly amount of money so that I feel feel okay with this thing and uh, I think I won like 250 or 300 buy-ins, so like 120K or 100K or something, at just $2, $4, and then I, by then I was playing a little bigger stakes at the yeah. end. But basically I, I won a number where I looked at the number of buy-ins, I think it was Poker Tracker back then. Yeah, I was gonna say Poker Tracker or, or Holding right. Manager, right? And I was like, okay, wow, you know, I think, all right, I think I could go down this path. Um, yeah, kind of didn't look back from there. Well, what was it what was it like back then i mean one of the questions i was going to ask you was when was the 
when was the easiest money you ever made? I mean, what was it like back then? I mean, it sounds incredible. Well, I think there were a lot less resources. Um, so you had to figure more things out on your own, which was harder in some respects, but also the competition, partly because of there being a lot less resources, mm. was a lot lower level. Um, so I don't think that would really be... I, I haven't played $2, $4 or online in a, a while. A long I think time. Very, very doable today. Um, you know, back then I think the games were much softer um, if you really applied yourself kind of thing. And uh, I don't know. And I guess that, that trait of always asking why in school now suddenly becomes vital now you're playing poker, right? Yeah, I think that's something that served me pretty well as, as a, probably in life overall, but especially as a gambler. Mm. Like, um, I think that's a pretty, that's one of the more important parts of gambling is like, all right, what games am I gonna focus on? What am I gonna study? Okay, what things am I doing right? What things is my opponent doing wrong? What things are maybe I doing wrong, you know? Mm. Um, so yeah. I interviewed two of your good buddies this week, Peter Jetton and Gabe Patgorski, and I asked them the question, a question, and they both gave me the same answer, and it was, it was, how did you learn? What was the best form of learning back then? And they both said that it started out in the forums, and then led to a, a physical meetup in Vegas, and then boom from there. Um, was your was your journey the same, similar thing as to Peter and Gabe? Um, I I met them, you know, probably right around when they both met. Each, like I think we all met each other just about the same time, and uh, it. Those things they were saying, I would say, really helped me. But I think I had probably done a little bit more of my own learning and stuff um, at that point already. Um, so I remember I met Dave Benefield, actually. He was here. Yeah, he's here. And uh, then there were, I think from, it was 2 plus 2, I think there was this meetup thing in Vegas that Dave was going to. But I didn't know, I don't know if I even had a 2 plus 2 account at that point. Um, and anyway, somehow Dave convinced me and I went and then met Peter and, and all those guys. I don't know if Dave knew Peter and them first. I think maybe not. Um, I think Dave, Dave convinced Peter to, to go. I think I spent a ton of time and work and stuff uh, getting a bit better, kind of on my own, trying to figure things out. Um, and then with a lot less time and effort talking to um, you know, other people that were pretty good at poker and pretty smart. You were able to learn so much faster, so much quicker. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think I think I had had a, like a bit of success when that stuff already happened, but it was like, I would say I was maybe playing quite soft competition. So I was a little better than the soft competition, but I didn't, you know, the getting pretty good at the game kind of stuff happened from talking to other people and all that. Yeah, I think Gabe said when he got there, there were, there were definitely different levels. Gabe was like, I was at this level and then there was Tom and I at this level, you know. But it was great that everybody was there helping each other out. You think about the old school, old school pros in the time when the whole camp first came out, refusing to go on TV shows because they didn't want to show their game to anybody. And then here you all are talking and sharing your game. Was there a part of it that was like, what am, what am I doing here? I need to keep a little bit. I'll share like 80% and keep a little bit myself. Yeah, I mean, I think I was pretty hesitant to share stuff uh, for a while, but in time I got to, like Phil Galfond, I talked to a lot back in the day. Um, there were a few people I trusted quite a bit that I thought were really smart people. Um, you know, and like Phil and I ended up playing a ton of hands together for a few years online. Mm. Um, but I think I felt like he was him, him and then uh, Z and Hack Dang, like You're in Danger and Trex was their online names. Um, but I felt like they were 
you know, they were pretty honest. So even if I gave them a tip and they made some money versus me, I didn't feel like they were trying to be sneaky or something. And I think I've seen that a lot where people, you know, I see at the poker table someone asking their buddy for tips, but actually they're like fishing for information and stuff like that. But, not, but not I think give I got lucky that. that I had a few friends where it wasn't really like that. So. Yeah, everybody's scratching, like a win-win uh, kind of situation type of thing. Well, I'm saying I think I've seen a lot of them where it's one, one person way. wins and yeah. the other loses. Yeah. I see that all the time. And I think there were a few people um, that I became friendly with that I thought it was a more mutual, like they were being more honest, sharing some tips, that kind of stuff. If you think about what we've just said here, it's quite remarkable. Um, Tom Dwan, Phil Galfon, Peter Jeddon, Gabe Patgorski, David Benefield, we probably could go on and on and on. You all ended up in the same place at the same time learning the game. I mean, when you talk about, I think last time I spoke to you and, uh, and I was saying about how your life turned out, you, you quite rightly said to me, it, it could have been completely different. I could have joined it, I could have got into the game 10 years later and the games could have been a lot tougher. I mean, do you look back at that moment and think, wow, that was, that was destiny, that, that was luck, I mean. You know, I think the time I got into the game was pretty lucky, but those people that I ended up being friendly with, I think that was uh, more likely to have, you know, that's like a good group of guys that were starting play at a similar time I was mm. um, so I don't know that one I doesn't yeah I don't know I feel like there was a lot of you know at that time a lot of the uh, poker pros would meet each other multiple times throughout the year that's when full tilt and stars were throwing so much money in yeah, the yeah. tournaments to the so it was like I, I don't know I guess I look at that as a little more not inevitable but like a little more likely to have happened one way or the other. Um, but something about the concept, I guess, of like, as a gambler, it's important to, to like, maybe not take advantage of your friends or something like that. I don't know, but I think something of that concept is probably why I got some buddies that like, I might beat Peter or Gabe for some real big bet somewhere or, you know, play against them in a real big game. But like, I won't say to them, oh, I think you're good at this game. Come play and then yeah, take all, yeah, even, you know, yeah. I, try, I don't know, something like that. As that, that, that core group, you, you've said there that you were very good at working on your own and figuring out things yourself and doing the work yourself. And then you met these guys and you were also good at like coexisting within a group and learning off each other. As you evolved and got better and better and the years went by, how did that kind of level itself out in terms, mm -hmm. of, how, in terms of how you learned the game? What do you mean? Did you continue more like on a solo route, figuring things out your same, or did you always have a strong group of people around you that you would talk hands about? Because a lot of people I speak about in that seat and I say to them, what was one of the best ways of learning poker? A lot of them always say, talking poker with other people, or right. talking, pe talking poker with people better than me. But, but what if there's not- I don't think the better than you is that important. Right. I think it's talking poker with people that are pretty smart right that's important um, because even if maybe you're a little better than someone else at the game there's still gonna be stuff they're better at than you um, and so if you have like some amount of humility and have decent enough communication then you can learn from each other you know um, but yeah I think like there were times I remember playing Gabe back in the day he played some 200, 400 PLO, you know, and obviously then I wasn't giving him like uh, advice or he wasn't giving me advice, you know, we were trying to take each other's money. Yeah. But I remember, cause I think I didn't know him that well then or something, but he like lost some and then he, I think he lost some or maybe he won, whatever. There was someone like this, it was maybe Gabe, one of our buddies that like, you know, I think lost a few buy-ins back and then they were like, hey, I'm gonna play some smaller. How'd you think I played? And so then that was like, a, oh, you know, there's not really a competition hmm. going on here. Like, and it was someone who had gotten like a little unlucky. And I was like, oh, you know, I think you ran pretty bad. You played fine. Something like that. Um, yeah, I guess if people, if, if uh, people are trying to be cool about it, then it's a lot easier. You know, if David asked me that and then the next day he showed back up in the games. I might have been a little irked if I was like, oh, here's something I think you're doing wrong and then he's playing me the next day. I'd be like, what is this? You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah. 
Um, but so I think it kind of, over time, you figure out the people that seem to be trying to be themselves, be pretty honest, you know, and uh, then you can, it can be mutually beneficial, you know, you can learn from your friends, they can learn from you, that kind of stuff. Even though sometimes, obviously if I'm sitting there at the same table as Peter or Gabe, we're not saying like, we're not, you know, I'm not saying, oh, Peter, here's a read I noticed on you. I'm like, I'm going to use that read and take his chips, you know? Yeah, yeah. But then if at the end of some tournament, he's like, oh, I, I keep losing every day. I guess I'm going to, you know, I might be like, hey, man, every time you have aces, you go like this, you know? But What did you think of um, the prevalence of online training sites then? I mean, I, Phil Gelfand decided to go make everyone good. I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he already was. Done was it? I remember when I joined and I googled like best players in the world, and Phil come up, and he had Blue Fire Poker at the time, and then run it once. I mean, judging by what you were saying, I, I, I have a feeling you might not be a best fan. I mean, I think at some, in some respects, it was probably pretty inevitable that uh, that stuff was happening, and I don't know. I don't know what I think about it. Um, I mean, I think it's good that people have the option to learn more about something they're interested in, if they want. But I also, this whole concept of like poker being a sport, you know, that people tried to say and stuff, I don't agree with that. I think it's a game. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's like basically two groups of people. You got a group of people there to make money you got a group of people there for enjoyment. And a lot of people are somewhere in the middle. But um, I think, you know, if you have too much of a race to the bottom of everyone trying to find every last tool they can, that can be, can kind of mess up the game or the economy and stuff a little bit. You know, you don't want it to turn into chess where there's just no money. <laughs> like, well, now we've got solvers and everybody's plugging their you know, their hands into solvers and... Yeah, so I think that it's kind of on the organizations to, uh, you know, and here I think Triton has some of responsibility. Don't know exactly, it's, there's no easy answers yet, mm. but um, of trying to set up a good structure that's just trying to be cool, effectively. And you're not, you're always going to make mistakes, you're not going to get things perfect. Um, but I think you want to keep that, you know, environment where it doesn't feel like some people have no chance and some people, you know, I think like full ring, no limit turned into that for a while where mm. if you had recreational players playing, it seemed like they had almost no chance because it just the mechanics of the game, the equities, people had studied so much. Um, but I got some ideas, so. We'll see. I was going to say, you make an interesting point, because actually everybody at Triton who sits down at the table does think they have a chance. Well, in any one tournament, obviously that's always true, but I mm. think it's also just, you want to kind of keep everyone's interests in mind, you know, meaning um, you don't, I think sometimes there's been a tendency of the loudest voices get heard a little more and the loudest voices are going to be the people trying to make money, you know, and trying to push for their own mm. opinions, but then you might lose the businessman. That's something that's happened in a lot of tournament series and a lot of poker games, mm. and then all of a sudden everything dries up, and you'd, you know, you'd rather have a bigger pie and have a smaller piece of it or whatever. I guess short deck is an evolution of that, right? Is people thinking, I don't know, how do we take care of everybody in our little part of the ecosystem? Well, Short Deck was just a game that came up in China where, you know, this guy was uh, frustrated that uh, he was losing, and so they took out the two, three, four, five. I think, I think he took out the six. I think he took out two, three, four, five, six. And then at some point they put the six back in. Um, but I think that kind of stuff makes sense, you know, just change it up a little bit. Hmm. And... Uh, you know, I'd still generally bet on the pros and a new game kind of thing, but it's just uh, makes it a more friendly environment and stuff. So, is it is it got to the point where it it's become so much more than you just tune up and play in a poker game? Like, is there a responsibility? Feel a responsibility to make sure that 
everything around you, the environment and the structure, everything works so there is a game that you can play in. Because I'm sure there are people that just rock up and play. Um, are, you, are you one of those or are you one that's kind of like, hang on a minute now, we need to look longer term? Or ha and have you been doing that? What do you mean? Um, Say so like Andrew Robo's game, for example, you know, I'm sure he's, he's like at one point he was just somebody who came and played a game and then it was like, okay, I need to think about how this is going to be sustainable going forward. Are you someone who takes a vested interest in that? Like almost like looking after your part of the poker community? Yeah, I think I care about kind of, there's, I mean, I always say the being cool, I don't, maybe there's some better words I could use, but just trying to um, have an awareness of different people's interests and uh, a more sustainable, you know, uh, situation, especially if I like the people. Um, but, you know, practically that doesn't always... It sounds really challenging. <laughs> ...pan out, yeah. Can be. And, and when it comes to, we talked a little bit about um, Phil Galfon's journey and the online coaching and stuff. Not just in poker, I'm not just talking about poker here now, but are you the type of person who would hire a coach or did hire coaches in the past? No, I've never had a coach before. Don't worry, don't worry. Um, but I've, I've talked to friends a lot and stuff, but uh, I don't know, I've just never had a situation where I think where I really trusted it kind of thing. It would need to be a situation where I thought someone was way better than me at a game and I trusted that they would give me, you know, actual honest mm. advice and stuff. Um, but I've had a, a lot of times where I thought friends were almost as good as me or a little better than me or same level and we talked back and forth. Um, you know, and obviously generally that's if you're not playing, if you're playing that person every day, that gets a little weird. But, uh, you know, often you do that in a situation where it's with someone you're not playing that often. What about the mental side of things? You know, like these days, you people hire people like Jared Tendler and Elliot Rowe to help them deal with tilt and that kind of thing, you know, meditation and that kind of stuff. How, how have you been on, how do you calm yourself and have you ever explored that area of your game? Um, I think there's a lot to learn from meditation or meditation-like things or kind of like uh, stuff like calming your brain um, but I don't think I've I don't think I've ever really focused on that stuff that much how it relates to poker hmm. I think I've more done it how it relates to life and then that ends up helping the poker um, I guess I learned from Robo the, they, everyone always said the Robo walk the Robo walk. Yeah, I meaning when Robo would lose a big pot or two, he would just go for a walk, and uh, and you know uh, people would laugh at him for it. And uh, I remember I used to laugh at him for it and sometimes give him a hard time. Um, but I think when you're in, especially if you're in a, re a bunch of really funny situations, you know. So I I had laughed at that back in the day when I was playing a lot of PLO all the time in a similar structure, similar. And all of a sudden, when we were playing short deck, I was like, well, what do I do with this hand? And I started learning from the robo walk, and I'd go for a little walk for a minute, you know. Right, right, like, to, fi to figure what things this? out. This is a whole new game. What's going on here? <laughs> um, so. The robo walk. And um, going back a little bit to when you, when you realize that, hang on, this, this poker thing's working here. You, you've had a good, good push on 2-4, and you started to make the money. At that time, and probably when you were younger, what were your beliefs and your thoughts around money and making money back then? And how has that changed as you've evolved through life? I don't know exactly, but something, something like, you know, this is an imperfect world, obviously, in so many ways. But, uh, you know, it may not be a perfect system, but I haven't heard of a better one than a capitalist system of, like, yeah, it's got its flaws, but there's a reason things are like this mm. um, because there's no, you know, there aren't perfect answers and stuff. And getting some more money gives you more options to whatever that may be um, to to use that money in 
in ways you choose to affect change, do some good, have a, you know, stay at a mon, whatever, like, um, and uh, I guess being able to make some money doing something I liked, at least some of the time, I'm not saying I like poker when I've been up 30 hours and I'm in some poker game, but yeah. uh, overall, it's, it's, you know, it's worked for me or fit for me, so. Was you ever, was you ever one of those kids that wanted more, you know, it was like, one day I'm, get the, well, I'm going to be a millionaire, I want to be a millionaire, I want money, I want money. And then you, they talk about the plateau, right? So I can't remember what the figure is, but you, is it 250 grand a year or something you earn? You get excited and excited and excited and, and you want, you know, every time you earn more and more until you hit 250K and then it's just like, no more, no more amount of money is going to increase my happiness. I mean, you've obviously gone over that barrier. So how, how, how does it feel as you earn more money? Well, for me, it's more of a, like playing poker and stuff is more of a means to an end of like, there are things I'd like more money for. Mm. Um, and so, I don't know, I happen to, uh, you know, if I've been playing 30 hours and I ask myself, why am I playing this game often? It's like, well, I think it's worth enough to be worth another coffee and push a few more hours because I can use that money later kind of thing. I don't know how to explain that great, but, um, you know, and, and if I haven't played for a week or two, a lot of times I enjoy playing. There's mm. stuff about it I like. Um, like I said, if I'm pulling a bunch of 30, 40 hour days in a row, <laughs> then, then uh, you know, often then that's a little more, I'm pushing myself that much for the money kind of thing. But uh, I guess the way it all balances out to me is that uh, overall, I don't mind, you know, the the downsides of the costs of it mm. are less than the gains to me. So, I mean, if you catch me on a real big losing day, I might not feel that way, but yeah. usually. <laughs> there's, a, there's a great book called Conscious Capitalism um, by John Mackey, who created Whole Foods. And it, and it, and it just goes through how um, you can, capitalism can be used for good if there's a some conscious reasons why you're in the money and what you're going to do with it. And I know I've spoken to you before and you've, you've alluded on it that you'd like to talk about it more in the future, but you know, you're not just earning money just because you want to buy yourself a lot of shit, right? I mean, you, you are interested in making a change in the world as well, right, Tom? I'd like to, there's a few things I'd like to give a shot at someday, you know, we'll see. Um, what does freedom mean to you? I don't know exactly, but I like it. <laughs> you know, I think the, at least for me, the more freedom I have to make my own choices, stuff like that, you know, I, I, makes me happier. I like it. Um, I think that's probably some of why I'm, I'll push myself for a long poker session or why I've studied hard in the past. I'm sure I will again because it's, I'm like, well, sacrifice some freedom for these days of play nonstop or whatever it may be, study a ton and some, hopefully some things come of it that, you know, get more freedom in the future in this area or more money mm -hmm. that you can use in some way. Um, I don't know, something like that. I don't know if I got, a, got it that clear in my head, so I can't explain it great probably, but. It, it, there's a paradox in this somewhere because um, has, there, has, has there ever been a time when you've been chained to the game and, and, you, and you've not liked it? Yeah, I guess there were probably times where I felt like I really had to grind um, not as much from my own choosing. And the, yeah, that, that's a little more upsetting. But uh, if I'm choosing to, then yeah, I'm all right with it. You know. has, has there ever been a, a time where you thought your career would end, that you worried about poker not being there for you or, or not, being a, not being the right path for you at a particular time? I think not too, you know, not too significantly kind of thing. I mean, obviously there's times where I have some big losses or something and in that moment you're not, you know, cranky about it or whatever, not happy about it. But uh, I, don't, I don't think really, you know. So we say in like, for most of the time in your career, things have been pretty okay. Well, I, I don't think I've really questioned the choice of playing poker or, that much and stuff, you know. Um, 
sometimes I wished like, oh man, I wish I had a smaller piece or I wish I had risked a few less buy-ins there or stuff like that, but... Uh, and you spend uh, an, an inordinate amount of time playing poker. I mean, what, what does poker teach you about life? Well, there's times I spend an inordinate amount of time playing poker, but there's also times I don't play any for a month. Uh -huh. um, and so I think I like something about that. I like being able to, um, you know, choose when I'm working some amount, right? Mm. Um, and so the freedom that comes with that and stuff, I think that's one of the reasons poker worked for me. Um, what it taught me about life is, uh, you know, I think I've learned some ways to assess information from poker. I think uh, people could use a little more of that. Our society could use a little more of that. Um, and it basically, maybe one of the biggest, maybe the biggest lesson I've learned from poker is like, you're not always going to be right. And anyone who thinks they're always going to be right is, you know, full of shit they're not they're not gonna I want to bet against that guy at the poker table mm. if they think they've figured it all out um and I think that's kind of a cool concept um because it's true in a lot of walks of life that a lot of times there's not the best you can do is give it a good guess and you know try to hope it works out and accept it if it doesn't um but yeah I think I think a lot of people uh when it comes to assessing information, oversimplify a little bit. And uh, I think you can see that in like political things going on. You can see it in a lot of different, just a lot of people, um, you know, uh, kind of don't sit back and say, oh, I'm not really sure of this one. Hmm, that's confusing. You know, mm. people don't like that. They try to try to get an answer. It's like black or white. Yeah, I mean, it's even if you talk about for example, in the U.S., like the political polarization, you know, it's mm. like people that are more conservative, right-leaning, watch more conservative, right-leaning TV. People that are more, you know, uh, liberal, left-leaning, whatever you want to call it, watch more left-leaning TV. And it's instead of saying like, oh, I wonder what's wrong on this side, I wonder what's wrong on that side, more people are like, oh, yeah, this is what's right, this is what's right, you know, not kind of qu questioning or realizing the stuff they might be, um, maybe can't be sure of or stuff like that. And that's something you learn in poker is like you, all the time you can't be sure of something. Mm. When you think you have someone's strategy figured out, often they surprise you, you know? It's like, it sounds like uh, deep reflection added to that, what, that why again, <laughs> and, and, and a little bit of, like you have an inquisitive mind, right? Well, but, I think it's more, I'm more saying it's just a concept you, or at least people learn if they're good poker players, is that you, you get a little better at assessing information and one of the things you learn is that you, you don't know for sure. Mm. Um, you know, and like inevitably people win a few tournaments or have, win a few, you know, have a few wins in cash games and they think they have it figured out, but usually that doesn't last unless they're sitting there saying, oh yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure, but here's what I think, you know. People that really think they got it all figured out often, you know, have a slide kind of thing. So you said that you, uh, you, 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 when you play, you play, but there's the, you know, you might not play for a month or so. So what, what are you doing when you're not playing? What are the type of things you're interested in? What are you reading? That type of stuff. What am I reading? Oh, that, I don't know. Varies. Um, I think it depends, depends what, uh, Sometimes I'll get a little burned out if I've played really long times. Sometimes I'll want to take time off. Sometimes it'll just be there's not great games. Sometimes have some life stuff, family stuff come up, or sometimes focus in other areas. Um, in the last few years, I've started having uh, more of my work time. That's It used to be almost all my work time was in poker, and now I'm starting to do a little bit more work outside poker, which I like. It's neat. Mm. Um, yeah, you you were saying you've um, you've been dragged more to metric gaming these days and doing more on that kind of part of the business here. Yeah, that um, even I'm trying to help plan some. Uh, got a few concepts for Triton that might pan out. Do, maybe doing some cool um, kind of new tournament concepts that I'm sure there will be hiccups, but maybe something cool ends up coming out of it. Um, 
And I think I like that. I like brainstorming new ideas. And also then it ends up, then I am happy to get back. If I haven't played poker for two weeks, yeah, then I enjoy it. it again, you know, for the first. If I'm playing poker every day for a month, oh, by the end of it, I'm like, I don't want to see a poker table. So are you a CEO type or are you a, here's, here's, the, here's the money, oh, get on with it. it. No, I'm like, I think I could be, you know, be a decent chairman of the board type, but I am not that you're, oh, you want to short that company if I'm the CEO. I'm just, even thinking of strategies in poker, for example, um, I can be quite good at refining other people's strategies or catching the gaps in theirs. But when I come up with my own, inevitably I'll do some ridiculously goofy stuff that's like, you know, really wildly not right. Usually I'm, I'll, I'll try to be decent at catching it. Um, you know, noticing when I'm like, oh, someone else, oh man, this thing I was doing, someone just got me twice. Like, mm. gotta, gotta but you, catch but you're testing, you're trying. You're... Right, but I'm saying some people are much better at, for example, a CEO type where you'd want someone to be, have much more reasonable structures and plans. Um, I'd need to think with short deck for some of the ones I came up with, some of the strategies I came up with. There was a time where I was playing short deck. Uh, you know, I first started playing short deck in 2016, I think. So it was really before people got in the game. And uh, there was quite a long chunk where I would say I was quite a bit better. You know, like there yeah. weren't many pros that had played a lot online and stuff that were in short deck. Um, and I would say I was quite a bit better than the people I was playing, probably just about anyone was, that was playing the game for a while. Um, probably till like a year and a half ago or something, where more, maybe two years ago, where more Damn pros these started coming in. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, some of the concepts I came up with were just, in hindsight, so stupid. And I was still doing all right and winning a bit of money and stuff. But uh, yeah, it, uh, I, don't think I'm, I don't think I'm the CEO type of guy. You, you were saying uh, the last time we spoke that you're not, af you're not afraid of making mistakes, you're, you're more afraid of not, not trying out something. Yeah, but that's, you don't want that as a CEO, right? You want <laughs> no, 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 but, but <laughs> no, that's, right. it's an important so that's part. something that I think, I actually make a lot of mistakes, um, probably more than most of the people I'm playing against and stuff. Um, and I think sometimes I'm quite good at figuring out new stuff that other people haven't and I think I'm pretty decent at catching my mistakes but sometimes I still make so many mistakes that it doesn't balance out sometimes it does you know so it depends is that poker and, and life catching your mistakes and and I'll have to add another question on that while you're thinking and do you have a process in in which you catch those I think trying to talk to other people so in poker other hmm. poker players but poker you also see you can more quickly see when when you're like oh this must have been wrong someone just got me and then go think about it um life sometimes it's you know a little less apparent um i would say i'm decent when it comes to life at catching my mistakes but yeah i make a lot of them i mean how how long were we supposed to do this interview and i wasn't i had too many things going on these, yeah, these days yeah. Um, what is it that, what is it that people don't know about you that, you know, the people see you, you know, they, people don't see much of you actually, you know, so there's a lot of assumptions about Tom, about, you know, about who you are because of what you are within poker, but what is it, what is it about you that people might not really know about? That's a tough question, man. That's like, I feel like I need a time bank for that one. Come back <laughs> time, chip, time chip, time chip, time chip. Um, I don't know. I think I've, I try to be pretty candid with, I mean, obviously there's some things, if I think everyone else is missing some poker strategy, I don't just share that on an interview or whatever. But overall, I think I've been pretty candid with how I think about life, about the game, about stuff like that. So, mm. um, nothing jumps out at me. Um. I guess the, the, no, not much jumps out at me other than the, I think it's quite important, this kind of concept of, uh, you know, you got people 
showing up to poker for enjoyment and you got people showing up to make money and then obviously a lot of people that are a combination of the two. Yeah. Um, I think that's really kind of shaped a lot of my professional life and that's, I think that's something that even though I've said that and some people have an idea, even people at this Triton stop, people I'm a bit friendly with, some of them don't quite realize how much I'm like, hey guys, like we're all missing something here. We gotta, mm. I don't have the answers, but we gotta make some changes because um, a ton of people love gambling, love playing poker. It can be a cool mental thing and it can be interesting and mentally stimulating if people are gonna gamble anyway. Why don't you do it at poker instead of at blackjack or yeah. at baccarat or something? Um, but you know, if you have people going and studying for a thousand hours and some guy wants to show up and play eight-handed no limit hold'em, they're not gonna like their experience. So you gotta keep coming up with new stuff. You, um, you do step up, don't you? I, I remember at the time of the old full tilt debacle, you know, when everybody was unsure about what was going on and nobody was saying anything from the full tilt side and everyone was panicking, you, you stood up. Uh, obviously there was a lot of pressure on, around that situation on a lot of people, but I, uh, I, I like the way I handled that stuff. I thought, you know, I tried to do my best or whatever. Mm. I'm sure, in hindsight, obviously I could have done things even better and stuff, I'm sure, but I just tried to, I, I thought they, they could have. I thought Full Tilt could have done things a bit different. I thought they could have, uh, obviously, look, there were plenty of mistakes made before Black Friday, but I'm saying even the day after Black Friday, mm. I, you know, I wish they had done things a little different. Um, and when I felt like my opinion of that wasn't getting heard, then I tried to do what I, what I could for my side, so. But. It did, it did, it did show, a, um, it did show a really endearing part of your character, though, because you know, again, we go back to this right at the beginning of our talk, you know, the difference between the path of least resistance and carving out your own path. I mean, the path of least resistance, people would have just buried their head in the sand and just disappeared and not spoke about it, but you didn't do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I've made plenty of mistakes in life, but I try to, I don't know. I'm not too much of a path to least resistance kind of guy. I try to do what <laughs> seems right to me. And I, all the time I'd do something that in hindsight was a mistake or sometimes maybe I was an asshole, you know, and you just say, oops, my bad. But I, you know, I'm not a least resistance kind of guy. I try to take it, have an opinion, you know, if it seems like an important spot to have one. Um, but that probably goes back some to the kind of like poker assessing information, you know, that kind of, concept of like, okay, well, a lot of times you don't know the right answer, but, you know, if you don't know the right answer and someone's having a heart attack and someone else is like, I'm a cardiac surgeon, let me handle this, then yeah, you probably should. But if mm. there's no one else to handle it, like you, someone's got to guess, you know. And, and, and there'll be people watching this who, who are stuck on that path of least resistance. They'll be watching this because they want to be professional poker players. Now, we're not here to advocate whether you should be a professional poker player or not, but if you're stuck and can't be a professional poker player, you'll be stuck in life in other areas as well. What, what advice could you give to people to shift out of that societal conditioning kind of robot kind of life and to try to risk something different? Well, I think we all, you know, there's, I feel like most people I've met, there's something I could learn from them or, you know, if I was in a good enough mood and paying attention, hopefully something I did learn. Um, and all the time I'm tired or cranky or whatever, I just lost a big pot, so I don't, but uh, I think we all have stuff we could learn from each other. And, you know, the piece of advice I give whenever people ask me on tips of how they could be better at poker is catch your mistakes. You know, don't mm. be so afraid of making them. Like everyone's so afraid of making mistakes. Mm. And I think that's not just in poker, I think it's in life. Like, we all make mistakes all the time. Maybe I make a few more than most people, but, you know, try to be a little aware of it. Like, it's, that's what makes us human. We all make mistakes, you know. Um, but yeah, I don't know. 
and uh, forget the, the full tilt thing is way gone, but you've now got back on the horse again and you stuck a patch on your arm and you're a Triton ambassador. What, what, <laughs> what tried to I actually ask? still got it on this shirt. It wouldn't, because I took it off some other shirt and there was like gunk all over it from the patch. So See, I got like it still stuck a, on this You're such thing. a newbie ambassador. Um, what, why? What, what, what made you uh, come out of retirement, uh, ambassador retirement? Well, I have, you know, <laughs> this is something about Triton, right? You're asking me the question about Triton on the Triton interview, and I still don't got, have my answer. <laughs> but I think that's kind of a good thing. It's like uh, I've been pretty involved, you know, from the start. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> obviously, Richard and Paul are both uh, good friends of mine. I think, you know, one of the things I said, actually, before doing this was like one of the conditions I had was uh, basically I didn't want to just do the same formula everyone else has done hmm. that in my view hasn't really worked like you tournament field sizes aren't growing they're shrinking and people aren't saying their experience is getting better they're saying their experience is getting worse in tournaments i don't have the answers but sometimes i can put my finger on oh this thing doesn't seem right let's try to figure out something to do hmm. and i think that's what you're seeing you know like obviously all the time there might be some mistake here or something there but i've feel like Triton's trying to say like all right like how, how can we mix things up how can we th do things a little different how can oh people are taking a little too long all right throw in a shot cock oh you know come up with new ideas and try to have the experience be nicer and better and then hopefully the field sizes grow and then the experience gets better for the businessmen and then the mm. pros are happy because the field sizes grow and you know and hopefully we make good enough decisions and uh Hopefully we catch those mistakes early and that, that goes the right way as opposed to being like, oh man, look at all those mistakes, too, too bad. But, uh, you know, so far I think things are working out. So. so everybody's been looking from the outside in thinking, oh, Tom plays at Triton events. It's the only events he'll play at, but what's really been happening is you've been an integral part of it from like a foundational brick from the beginning. No, it's not that. I mean, like this summer I might play the World Series um, and it's not that I won't play other events it's more like the the thought of traveling to go to some poker tournaments and deal with getting stared at for a few minutes and all that like it just isn't that exciting the value is not mm. there the money's not there um triton has a bunch of uh, big games around it, you know, not just the TV games and stuff, but also some side games a lot of times. And uh, the tournaments are obviously much bigger buy-in. There's a bunch of them. Yeah. And I like the people. I like the structure, you know. And then if I'm not showing up, Paul or Richard will be like, hey, hey, make sure you get here a day earlier. You know, yeah, go, yeah. go play that tournament. Um, but uh, I think the whole way it's handled is pretty cool. And I, you know, huh. short dick's cool for tournaments, man. It's yeah. like... I think it's a cool tournament game. Partly it's new, but also it's because the equities are all closer. Um, I think it's, it plays out pretty cool from a tournament standpoint that it's like, um, you know, a lot of people still don't have stuff figured out. And I can tell you as someone who knows this game pretty well, I don't have the stuff figured out. And I've heard a lot of people explain how they have stuff figured out, and they definitely don't have stuff <laughs> don't figured know. out. And they don't know. So, um, you keep you, you said earlier on that I wish I could think of a different word other than cool, but I think cool is the right word to use when you're talking about what's going on here and what we're creating. Well, the reason I say try to be cool is like, to me, that's kind of a concept of life, especially when it comes to gambling, of like. You can't always be, right? If you're playing against someone, you're not going to tell them their mistakes or something. But just when possible, try to, you know, hmm. try to be cool. When, when convenient, just, uh, and I think, you know, it seems like Triton's trying that. They're, you know, I think that's part of why you have a lot of people coming and, yeah, and having a little bit of a different feel. It's definitely stuff. growing. I was going to ask you one last question, but I've got to squeeze one more in now because I can't let it go. You're going to go to the World Series. Yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, the reason I didn't play World Series the last few years, I might have played main event, two, three, three, I think three years ago, was four years ago was the last time I played main event. But I played some cash there. It was just, 
like I either had stuff going on or when I was there, I was like, oh, three day tournament for a 10K, I don't know. But I'm gonna probably be in Vegas a bit of uh, June and July. So it's different if I'm there for a few weeks yeah. or a month, then I'm sure I'll hop in one of those tournaments. If I was only there for like a week over the course of the series, then I'd be like, ah, oh, two or three days in a tournament, that's a 10K, I'll wait, you know. That's one thing I like about Triton is it's pretty fast structure, a lot of the tournaments. Um, I, don't know. I know. I know the main event is actually the direct opposite of what we're doing here because this is like uh, very quick and easy, but the main event goes on forever. But what a memory, mate! If you went, if you did that for like six or seven days and you get to that final table, is that still something that you know gives you a little bit of a tingle, or is that? I mean, I'd love to go win the main event, but it's not. There's a lot of people. It's not easy. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> and it is a long. It's just like a long commitment. I know. It's been a few years that I was planning on playing the main event and something would come up where I'd be like, all right, well, I'm going to need to leave day three even if right, I have chips, right, so right. I guess I'm not playing, you know. So we're going to see, we're gonna, we're gonna see you there, but we don't know what you're going to play yet. I think I'll play. I'm not promising, but I think I'll play a tournament or two. Someone get him a bracelet bet. That'll sort him out. Um, last question. If your childhood you could see you today, what would they think? I think childhood me would be surprised I'm playing poker and I'm gambling but then not be you know think the ways I'm thinking I'm like oh yeah I guess that, I guess that does fit kind of thing like uh, I had never really thought about it as a profession when I was a kid yeah. or something like that but looking back it's like oh yeah it make, makes sense I think that you know 10 year old me or whatever but like all right yeah I could see that <laughs> but uh, at the time I never thought of the concept so well, Tom, thanks for joining us on I Am High Stakes Poker. It's been a really pleasure speaking to you. Thank you.